It's hump day. Welcome to Kickback with Kelly and Barbara, this Wednesday edition. Now, Monday, we chatted a little bit about food and got you all really, really hungry. And today, we're kind of following along with that narrative a little bit. But so today is all about We're kind of still talking traditions. about food, so I kind of still want to eat. Oh, has it got to that point? It has got it's to like that point. And it's always, let's be honest, it's always at that point. Who else wakes up in the morning thinking about what they're going to have for dinner? Me. Uh, but yes, today we will be talking a little bit about food, but more so on the aspect of preserving traditions yeah. and our heritage and, you know, passing things down from generation to generation and overall just kind of keeping it in the family. That's right. So we're going to invite our first guest to come and join us on set, Dietrich M. Hoon. Let's get him on down. Welcome. Dietrich, welcome, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. It's so fun. This, this one's a little bit fun because you don't look anything like a hawker, um, but you, you are trying to be the next generation, right? Tell us a little bit about what your mum does. All right, so I think generally people need to know that um, Maxwell Oyster Cake is basically a kind of a snack food that you can also use for, I, mean, I guess, for lunch. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think people get very confused uh, between... Because it's not Oloa, right? It's not Oloa, yeah. Oh. It, it's, it's really <laughs> like... like the, the thing that we get the most often is people think, is, think that it's Oloa. And like, uh, 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 it's more like a cake slash UFO slash burger. What's, <laughs> UFO? what's inside? I don't even know what's inside. So, um, so we, 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 let's say we start, like my mom starts to put batter on, on the base. Mm -hmm. uh, we put a bit of chives, um, cilantro, uh, put a bit of uh, pork and we do a special seasoning on it. Put a bit of oysters and prawns and then we cover it up and then we deep fry it. I like how you make it all fancy and say like cilantro. Coriander la. <laughs> coriander, <laughs> coriander. <laughs> okay, so how long has your mum been doing this? Uh, as of this year, 55 years. Wow. Oh, that's a so long time. So I think the, the history is that we started back in Trust Street. Um, a lot of people who have continuously buy, uh, bought our food for the last 50 years, they remembered that it was from there. Mm. And then uh, government came in and moved most of the hawkers into Maxwell Market and created that whole hawker system. And uh, it's great that we moved there. Uh, now my grandma is retired. Um, she's living the life. She's 98. I should hope she's retired. <laughs> <laughs> like at 98, if you're not retired. You don't really want to be frying oyster cake at 98. But so, so how or when, at what point did you start to get more involved and what are you doing with the business now? I think I've always been involved because uh, my mom always raised me from from when I was at a young age center. at the Hawker Centre, yeah. <laughs> I used to do like all my homework things here and all that stuff <laughs> at the back and like doing homework. But uh, I think it mainly really started uh, after I'm 21 uh, where she really needed help. Mm -hmm. uh, and having uh, getting help at the Hawker is really tough. Um, not everybody is willing to commit uh, the fact that it's not easy to find people to work in a Hawker system mm. um, is really difficult. So I think it's always good to have family to come in. Uh, and that's where we started to realize over the years uh, that we needed our own social media page uh, in order for people to contact us, let them know, put some of the articles like I think uh, Anthony Bourdain w mainly wrote his book around uh, Maxwell Market when he traveled here mm -hmm. and uh, he was going to visit Chicken Rice. But he walked past our store because Chicken Rice store is not that far away from us. Mm -hmm. uh, and he noticed, I mean, he's never seen this. Yep. And he, he got really honest, curious. You don't find it very many places, do you? Nah. No, you Olua, don't. yes. But oyster, oyster cake? cake? Yeah. It's, like a, it's like a fish cake, but amped up with oysters and other cool stuff. I guess, I think that the, in, the dish itself, yeah. Uh, yeah. This is quite uh, unique in that sense. Uh, I think the, the cool thing about it is, uh, there are other people who are doing uh, quite a similar dish, uh, but mm -hmm. I, I, I would dare to say that we have some um, our own variation, and we've kept to it like for the last fifty years. Uh, there are some things that we we have changed up. Uh, it's like the brown, the brown, the black vegetable. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really know the name of it. Hey, uh, friend, you're gonna want to be a hawker. You gotta know the name <laughs> of your ingredients. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> like, like it's it's this. This round piece of vegetable that is preserved and, and we used to use that in, in, a, in a long time ago during Trust Street and then kind of moved into uh, the whole uh, cilantro. cilantro style <laughs> and, and rocked with that vegetable instead. 
because it gives that fresher uh, taste. Yeah, I think it, I guess packs a little bit more of a punch, right? As mm. opposed to yeah. a preserved taste, you get that fresh coriander, like a little bit of oomph. So you were mentioning just now that it's hard to find people that want to actually continue in the hawker trade, but it's it's sort of become a bit more fashionable in very recent years. We mm. went through a wave, yes. our hawker culture went through a wave of suddenly everyone was outsourcing it to foreign talent and you were seeing a lot mm. of our local dishes being prepared by people who you're like, yeah. do you really know how to cook our local dishes? But then in the past few years, we have seen a resurgence of young people such as yourself who have gone, actually, this is a great way of preserving heritage. Um, I think that's why we felt that, like, I think myself, my mom, we, we've always talked about this uh, a lot. And uh, we wanted to continue, uh, I think even myself wanted to continue because there are a lot of people who really enjoy the dish. Mm. And, and if we were to say thank you, goodbye, uh, I think a lot of people are disappointed. Uh, especially like in, in Maxwell, there used to be a thing called uh, the tapioca balls. And it used to be run by three wonderful aunties that, that watched me growing up. And because of, of illnesses, they had to stop. And, and they didn't even find somebody to take over. And, and that's what really bums me up. Wait, tapioca balls like bubble tea balls? Not really tapioca, but uh, uh, they call it in Chinese, it's fan shi tan. Ah, okay, okay. So it, it, it's really sad <laughs> to watch that go away. Mm -hmm. I, I, it, it, mm. it never felt so, I never felt so hurt watching them not be able to find uh, uh, somebody to take over. And that's what really is... And I guess it's it's also very different because it's not like they these aunties would have had the ability to just hop onto social media and be like, hey, anyone from the younger generation looking to learn how to make tapioca balls and take over this business? Because I think if they did, then then maybe people would have jumped on it. Because f and is hard. It is not your usual yeah. route. Okay, so we're going to continue this conversation about passing things on to the next generation when we come back from this short break. We'll also be welcoming our second guest on the show. Stay with us here on Kickback with Kelly and Barbara. And it's National Day weekend, this episode on What You're Cooking, fast forward. If you're creating some fantastic dishes with the colours of red and white, wondering how we can do so in a creative, fun manner, then this is your chance to watch out for our three amazing recipes coming up next on What You're Cooking, fast forward. Yeah. Good evening and welcome back to Kickback with Kelly and Barbara. We've got our second guest, Stanley Tan, with us today Hello. from Windflower Flo Flo Florist. 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 Windflower Florist. <laughs> so a little bit of background. Stanley and I used to actually used to go to school together. Yes. We were in Tomasic Poly. Um, we went to the course Communications and Media Management. Yep. Uh, but then you took over the family business yep. after uh, national service. That's right. That's uh, right. Give us a little bit of background. Why did you decide to take that leap into taking over? Over the family business. Okay, so a, a little background about uh, Windflower. It started in uh, 1997 at a small heartland mall in Loyang Point. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to run around the florist, you know, and uh, during Valentine's Day, especially when orders are really high, uh, they need delivery people. So literally, I would take all like the bouquets that my mom made, and I take MRT and I go to go to CBD. Oh, and that's I go so cute! So back, back then, I didn't really had a had an idea of. Uh, what, what is it all about? I just know that, okay, I have to help my mom to make money, you know, and, yeah. and that, that's from there. I think fast forward to uh, after national service, they wanted to close the business down because uh, it didn't really have uh, substantial sales. They probably wanted to change the mode of business to something else, uh, selling gifts instead, you know. And I think for when, when I heard about that, I figured, why don't I try taking it over? Mm. You know, but and then when I, when I went over there, uh, I started like, 8 a.m. I went to the shop, you know, and then after I sat there at 8 p.m., I only made six dollars worth of sales, you know, uh, selling just chrysanthemums. You know, all the aunties they'll come and say, ah, well, I want to buy pie, you know, go uh, to temple yep. with those flowers. So I think uh, when I was there, a lot of these uh, heartland mall vendors they were also like, oh, Stanley, why, why, why do you want to take over? You know, very, uh, it's a pity that you didn't go to university, you know, from there. Uh, but I figured that I wanted to really preserve what my mum and dad did. In fact, mm. this, was a, this was something that's born out of 
uh, my, my mom and my dad, you know, that really brought me and my brother up. And I figured, okay, let's, let's try this. Let's go social media, apply all my CMM skills. Mm. Hey, that's you not know. bad. If you're taking yeah. your diploma skills and yeah. applying them into real life, I mean, that's what it's all about, right? Yeah, correct, correct. You know, and then, like, I mean, just everything had to do from scratch. Graphic design, the logo, take photos of the bouquets, etc., etc. So... It was fun. It was fun. So you it. should be the poster boy for CMM. I mean, like, yeah. talk about like really applying <laughs> what you learned. Hundred percent applying it. So talk us through the process from sitting there for twelve hours and only making six dollars yep. to what you guys are today, which is absolutely phenomenal. The physical location of the store is gone in Pasiris. Yep. Yep. So um, you've yep. got employees in your business yep. now. That's right. So we have uh, we are we have a quite a bit of online presence. I so think about. 29k followers on Instagram, uh, 28k on Facebook. You know, we are making, uh, we are really focusing a lot on the, on B two C when it comes to the e commerce. That's more uh, than some influencers have. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think. yeah. Well, that's, no, I'm, I'm just saying, yeah, like yeah, yeah, potential yeah, yeah. wise, right? Yeah, I yeah, mean, I mean it is. You're, you're talking about going from reaching out to the people in your immediate neighborhood at Loyang Point yep. to suddenly going island wide. Yes. Um, and. 28, uh, almost 30,000 people yes, correct, reach correct. on a daily basis. Yeah, that's right. You know, and, and I think that um, one thing that I, when I started out uh, doing this, I figured that back then it was all the old school bouquets, you know, with like uh, three stalks of roses, you know, some baby's breath and, and stuff like that. And then you have those really high-end florists, you know, that charge like really exquisite, uh, a, a really high price, you know, but really very ex um, exquisite flowers, you know, they mm. import in and stuff like that. I figured, I need to find a sweet spot in between. And that was the key. You know, and from there, we started to pick off, you know, using social media. We try to sell that at good pricing. You know, we used the craft paper, you know, to, to wrap our bouquets. Back then, everyone was like, why well, you use chakwetel paper, you know, to, to wrap the bouquets? You know, now it's there. a... Now, 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 cool. now it's a thing. Now it, become, it became a norm. Yeah, so... And then from there, I think the industry grew over the last six years I've been in. You know, uh, a lot of new crafters have come into the industry, you know, and uh, the barriers to entry is low, uh, ultimately, but a lot of them are willing to try because of Instagram, take a photo, and then, yep, I'm selling my, my flowers. Mm. Maybe too how, right? But yeah. then, Dietrich, this is something that you've also done, not, not the selling flowers bit, but trying to maximize your distribution channels. How have you done that for your mom? So interestingly, we, we found out during the COVID period, uh, there was this thing called uh, Hawkers United. Uh, it's a Facebook group started by another hawker that was based in People's Park and uh, he started getting people to post pictures of their food, uh, delivery methods, uh, various kind of ways for people to try to get some sort of online presence, especially for hawkers, because you don't really do that in comparison with flowers because that is, uh, you can do a full model, but I'm not going to do a whole website just to sell one item or chicken rice, you know, you wouldn't kind of do that. You mm -hmm. do grab food. So this, this has been total change for us because that's where we start to meet other people who get engaged with us, you know, they, they go the extra mile. I think there was a gentleman called Jet and he approached us and said, hey, you know, um, I'm doing a delivery service uh, and we really want you on board. I said, okay, so let, let's discuss. Uh, and my mom want to keep it simple. Um, so she's just going to sell him exactly as it is. And then he does social media postings on our behalf. He does a huge pickup order for various zones. So he'll deliver like to maybe parceries on one week and then the other week he'll do Ishun. And so it gives us a, a, a wider audience of people who want to eat it but can't because of sheer distance. Mm. Um, Especially just, with Circuit Breaker and a lot of people working yeah. from home, right? You, 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 wouldn't you don't wanna, have that same volume at Maxwell. Yeah, you wouldn't want to come out uh, actively. Um, you'd rather have it delivered to you. And so that's where the whole thing came into the picture and that's where we get uh, sales on days that are not so good mm. uh, and that's what it really meant for us but on the flip side Jet is also helping us uh, with his social media postings to share what we are about and our, our food so the the weight of, of having to keep posting is less mm -hmm. and we're f fully focused on just making the food uh, keeping our Facebook page updated and getting any kind of requests like we still get requests on people ordering in advance and then they'll come at 4 o'clock but they'll order at 10 o'clock in the morning. So wow. nice. this helps a lot. So I'm quite curious as both of you is second generation in the business um, and a lot of the time when our generation, when we go into the workforce, we tend to face a, a little bit of backlash. We go into a corporate job with all these brand new ideas and some of the older generation in the workforce are resistant to it, 
right? So as taking over family businesses, was there much resistance in your ideas and your methodologies and how you wanted to take the business forward from your parents? And if so, like, how did you guys overcome it and be like, hey, it's okay, you know, maybe I know what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> I think for me, uh, I just straight away tell them, hand the business over, I'm going to make it big. That, that, that's, all, that's all it took for me to just uh, take it over. Then they were like, so you put yeah, about and, it. And they really just like, okay, okay bye. Okay, <laughs> you, you go for it, you know, you make it happen. I think my, my parents are just very chill people, you know. You put your big boy pants yeah, on and yeah, you said, okay, correct, I correct. got this. Yeah, I finished that, NS already. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> make it happen, you know. So I, I just like, whatever savings I had then, you know, I just like pump it in. I bought an iMac, etc. I said, I said, okay, let's uh, just trust me and we'll see how it goes. Aww. And they must be so proud of you, right? Yeah, I, I, I hope so. I believe so. You know, so now they are kind of like retired. My mum is taking care of the kid at home, you know, so it's, it's nice. My brother's kid. Yeah, not oh, not yours. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dietrich, what about you then? Did, was your mum at any point a bit hesitant about embracing sort of technology mm. or new delivery systems? Because it's like, yeah, it's not as fresh as if they come here and order, you know that, what I mean? That's usually the, the two sides of it. Like, mm. one side of it is... Um, she's welcoming of new tech because her, she herself is picking up stuff like what reading newspaper on iPad and whatnot. Uh, but the other side is where you get a bit of uh, her own gripes. Like she still wants to provide fresh food mm -hmm. to her customers. Mm -hmm. She wants to maintain the same taste that everybody has. Uh, but there is still a compromise because you still have to travel a distance. And so you, comparing with you eating at the store, uh, instantly versus you eating it an hour later. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing that we can help ask you to help reheat is put it in a toaster yep. and, and heat it up. But you still won't get that crispiness that we always have straight from yeah. the hood. I guess. So just to sort of round up this conversation from both of you then, why do you think it is so important for us as Singaporeans to be preserving our traditions i guess when it comes to food that's that's a bit more of our heritage linked in there but then stanley from you um preserving family businesses like a lot of us youngsters want to go out there and forge our own way but if there's something that's already good why is why is it so important to preserve yeah. mm, i think for for food wise uh i think I, I go back to my very first point is uh, it hurts It hurts the most when you watch food that you really love disappear mm. uh, and they are I wouldn't say a lot, but there is a small minority of people who are very willing to pick up the craft. Uh, they just don't have the means to do it. You don't, don't know have, how to, right? You don't know who to approach to. Yeah. So um, I think I've, I've had this uh, same conversation with, with uh, KFC to over a shoot once. Uh, and we had a couple of fun ideas. It was just tough part is um, his comment was, do you see the people who want to take over see it through? Because they're not family. And if they don't want to continue or they feel it's too tough, they could just walk away and have no repercussions. So that's where we get into this agree to disagree portion. Mm. Stanley, what about yeah, you in I terms of you know, family businesses? I think what I think is uh, because of the rapid changes in technology, a lot of our older generation, they don't really know how to use social media, don't really know how to get their products out. And I think that uh, even for the younger generation, those that uh, they have parents that's running a business, they... Mm they can share with them their knowledge, you know, on how things work nowadays. You know, it's not just a brick and mortar store and then like you start selling there, you know. I mean, with the Circuit Breaker, I can think it kind of show that that, that is the, the weakness of, of that kind of business model. So I think uh, the younger generation has so much more to share, you know, uh, so tech savvy nowadays. And it is very important to just kind of shed some light on and give some knowledge on how do you exactly get your products out there. And I think some of these uh, products that the older generation have uh, are really good. You know, but it's just that no one knows about it. And so that, that's what I think. That's true. Well, guys, thank you so much for sharing. I think it's important to see how you guys are stepping up to sort mm. of carry on our traditions here in Singapore and how Definitely. to make sure that, you know, our mom and pop shops don't end yeah. up shutting down. I think yeah. it's important to show that, I mean, these guys were enterprising back in their day. And yep. to be able to continue that and to be able to say, you know what, this, this is something that has longevity is very, very important. So if you need flowers, Go check out Windflowers. And if you You're need craving oyster cake, cake. <laughs> Maxwell Market is where it's at. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. We're going to be going off for a short break. When we come back, I'll be taking you through a little bit of a weighted workout. Uh, this is Kickback with Kelly and Barbara. We'll see you soon.
and it's National Day weekend. This episode on what you're cooking. Fast forward if you are creating some fantastic dishes with the colors of red and white. Wondering how we can do so in a creative, fun manner? Then this is your chance to watch out for our three amazing recipes coming up next on what you're cooking. Fast forward. Yeah. Welcome back to Kickback with Kelly and Barbara, minus Kelly for the moment. I'm going to be doing the workouts all by myself today. So we're going to be using two weights. It's not too heavy, uh, not too light. We've got nice dumbbells. We're going to be doing pure arm work. So we're going to do some bicep curls, some overhead presses, rows, and lying on the floor, my favorite, the chest press. So we're going to get started with the bicep curls. Key here is making sure you don't use momentum to swing everything. We're going to go in three, two, one, and there we go. 40 seconds, nice and easy. You want to make sure that your elbows stay nice and tucked in so you're not bringing them up and down as well. So you can bring it up all the way as close as you can, bring it back down and bring it back up. Now the key is also to not lose the tension. So don't just drop it down for the sake of dropping it. If you want, you can easily stop at that 90 degree angle, bring it up again. So the range of motion is a little bit less. We've got about 10 more seconds on the clock before we get a 20 second rest and move on to the next one. Taking it nice and easy, soft little bend in your knees, making sure you're not locking them out. And in three, two, one, and break, because that's about when we start to feel the burn. Next exercise, nice and easy, you want to have your weights just by your shoulders, you're gonna go for that overhead press. So if you want to, you can always aim to have that little, uh, what do you call it? It's like a turn. So that rotation going on. So we're going in three, two, one, and we rotate overhead press, bringing it back down and bringing it back up. Again, what you don't wanna see is kinda of like, just trying to heave it up because that puts a lot of strain on your back. So maintaining nice, good posture, keep that core, Nice and tight. Again, soft bend in the knees without locking them out. You want full extension, biceps by your ears, and then bringing it back down and bringing it back up. Oh, we've still got 15 seconds to go. Cool, 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 cool. Okay, just keep breathing as you're going through. So doing this by yourself is apparently a little bit more difficult compared to when you've got cameras focusing on both sisters instead. Yay! And we're going in time. Good. Next one, we're going to do single arm rows. So the key to this is if you're going to do the right arm, you want to put your right leg at the back, left leg forward, nice straight back. All right, so try not to round it out. You're going to lead with your elbow, keep it tucked in nice and close to your body. So when you do your arm row, you're just going to bring it up. Try not to hit the mic packs too much and bring it back down. All right, so leading with the elbow, keeping it close to the body and bring it back down. So you can probably afford to go a little bit heavier than what I've got here, uh, if you like. That's absolutely fine. But you wanna bring it down and bring it up. Good. Don't forget to breathe. We've got 20 more seconds to go. And then we switch, of course, to the other arm because you don't wanna have one arm stronger than the other. Woohoo. Okay. This is me, just going for it. And eight more seconds. I've got a little audience now. Everyone's coming to come and watch me work out by myself, because Kelly's not here. And time, we're gonna switch to the other side. So again, now we're doing the left arm, left leg behind, right leg in front, having that little hinge, flat back, so you're not rounding it, you're not overarching at the same time. And we're going in three, two, one, and good. Again, leading with that elbow, you might find that one hand is a little bit weaker than the other. That's absolutely fine. The reason sometimes that we like to use dumbbells instead of bars for these kind of exercises is so that you're working purely on one arm. You're focusing on that single arm balance. Uh, so same for your shoulder presses, your overhead press, using individual sides, you get to create that sense of balance. We've got another five seconds to go. You can do this. Ideally, we want to do a couple of sets each of these. And time. Good. Now it's my favorite bit. We get to lie down on the floor. Good. All right. So you want to have the dumbbells on either side. You can start with your elbows just pointing outwards instead. And you're just going to lift them overhead, almost as though as you're doing chest press. Again, we're focusing on keeping them, uh, yeah, we're not doing that rotation. That was a bad move. 
Okay, good. So we're going up and down, um, keeping it nice and balanced. Same thing applies when you're using the bar. When you're using the bar, you kind of have that ability to depend more on your stronger side to lift it up. Whereas if you've got individual dumbbells, you get to work a little bit more on strengthening both sides equally, which is fantastic. We've got 10 more seconds to go, keeping that back nice and flat on the ground, going up and down nice and steady. And in three, two, one, we're done. I survived it all by myself. Um, this has been Kickback with Kelly and Barbara, but like I said, it's just me today, which is absolutely fine. Um, going into Friday, it is the public holiday, so we're gonna be taking a little break from programming on Friday, and the week after, another little break as well, as here at Get Active TV, we're prepping for all the best national day programming just for you. Thank you so much for joining us today. We've had a blast talking about food. I think I'm gonna go and get some dinner, maybe buy myself some flowers. Happy Wednesday, everyone. Thanks for joining us.